Ford as one of the lar world's largest, most influential philanthropic organizations, and that is a challenging inequality. And his leadership is authentic. His focus on equality is nothing short of revolutionary and a clarion call for the world of philanthropy and an inspiration for all of us who are working for a more just and equitable world. And tonight, uh, Darren's going to be talking about the role of the Ford Foundation and philanthropy more widely in addressing issues of inequality around the world. So Darren's going to speak for 15, 20 minutes or so. I might then kick off with a couple of questions for Darren, but then I just want to open it for Q&A so that we have a real dialogue uh, running through the evening. So just for social media housekeeping, uh, for Twitter users, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Ford. Um, if you could put your phones on silent for obvious reasons, we are also going to be uh, podcasting the event, so um, please just do bear that in mind. When I ask you to call on you to ask a question, if you would like, please give your name and affiliation, but as I say, we are being podcast, so please just, um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's also fine. Um, so now, housekeeping done, could you please welcome, join me in welcoming Darren. Thank you very much, Julia, for that very generous mm -hmm. introduction. And what an honor to be here with you at the London School of Economics, this remarkable institution. It has few peers. And I want to especially say how thrilled I am to be able to address the fellows, the Atlantic fellows, because you are a special group of London School of Economics students. I want to say a little bit before I start about why the work that you do is so important and why LSE which is among England's and the world's great institutions, has such a storied legacy, and why that storied legacy about inequality matters more today than ever. The founders of LSE believe that by studying poverty and inequality, the students at this school could identify the causes of injustice and improve conditions for working people in the UK and indeed around the world. And the LSE's first director, William Hewins, wanted to make sure that this new school would be populated by representatives of the communities this institution and its ideas aimed to help. So it was a novel approach, in fact, in the late 19th century for a university to seek diversity of this sort, because most universities at that time were bastions of white male privilege. And so I am sure that Director Hewins would be very proud to look out into this audience today, because you represent in many ways the aspirations of the founders of LSE. The 19th century idea embodied in the 21st century. You fellows are lawyers and reporters, artists, activists, health professionals, community organizers, and leaders of civil society. You have experience throughout the nonprofit sector, government, and you have fought for evidence based journalism, for facts for ethical impact investing, and for social justice around the world. You have lifted up the value of creativity and music and shed a light on the importance of transparency and political participation. And you understand that these issues are indeed interrelated. You see the connection between housing rights and reproductive rights, social inequality, and educational opportunity, disability rights, and human rights. And throughout your careers, you have built bridges between community-based movements and institutional action. And you are joined together by an understanding that inequality is among our world's greatest problems. And by your commitment, you demonstrate that we can indeed attack this scourge 
called inequality. In the, in the past few years, my colleagues and I at the Ford Foundation have devoted our energies towards the fight against inequality because we believe that inequality in one or all of its forms is coded in just about every one of our social ills. In many ways, addressing the injustices of inequality has long been at the heart of our commitment to social justice. From our work supporting the civil rights movement in the US to the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa to help expand microfinance micro in the world. In putting a name on this larger issue today, we have come to see how pervasive inequality is in our lives and how interconnected its causes are. In the 11 regions of the world where the Ford Foundation works today, inequality is the one consistent theme we see. And we see inequality manifest in what we call the five drivers of inequality. First, the persistent prejudice and discrimination against women, people with disabilities, and racial, ethnic, and caste minorities is the first driver. The second relates to people's unequal access to government, decision-making, and resources. We also know that there are unfair rules of the economy. Those rules of the economy privilege the already advantage and discriminate against those who are already disadvantaged. There's also been a failure to invest in and protect vital public goods, such as education and our natural resources. And finally, the fifth driver, we see entrenched cultural narratives that undermine our progress towards fairness, tolerance, and inclusion. And it's really important that we understand this final driver, narratives, and understand the power of narratives. And I know that you fellows have been working on this narrative initiative, and it's one of the reasons the Ford Foundation has invested with Atlantic Philanthropies in creating this new entity. And one of the reasons the Ford Foundation has long invested in arts and free expression is to challenge prevailing narratives and give voice to communities and cultures that have been affected by inequality. At the same time, one of the most dangerous and pernicious byproducts of inequality is a narrative of hopelessness. Hopelessness renders people insecure, vulnerable, and anxious about their futures. And when this hopelessness is tapped by those who seek power, when it is tapped for narratives of hate, when it's weaponized for political gain, we see people make choices that are against their own interests and their community's interests. So how do we think about changing these narratives? How do we break the systems and cycles that perpetuate inequality? How do we lift up communities and create reasons for hope? We believe as a philanthropy, we must invest in individuals and in institutions and ideas. And we've worked hard at the foundation to build networks of leaders and organizations to magnify our impact and find partnerships that help us address the root causes of inequality. And of course, as president of the Ford Foundation, I often find myself pondering what it means for a privileged organization like the Ford Foundation to tackle the structural inequalities rampant in our own society and in our own institution? What does it mean for privileged legacy foundations like the Ford Foundation, founded by individuals who themselves enjoyed immense privilege, 
to commit ourselves to rooting out the very inequalities that allowed these institutions to be created in the first place. I often reflect on the words of Martin Luther King in the late 1960s. He talked about philanthropy in society. And what he wrote was, quote, philanthropy is commendable, but it must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the circumstances of economic injustice which make philanthropy necessary. In other words, if we are to enact true and lasting change, we have to embrace the root causes of injustice and the underlying reasons for human suffering in the world. And we have to use our privilege and exercise the freedom we have and extend those privileges and freedoms to other people. After all, of one of, as one of this institution's great founders said, we are all dependent on one another, every soul of us on earth. Those were the words of the playwright George Bernard Shaw. All of us depend on the leadership of you fellows, of you in this room. While presidents and prime ministers matter, at the end of the day, it is going to be you who change society. You who are, as Dr. King said in 1968, when America's cities were burning, where are our firefighters? You are the firefighters he spoke of and we are counting on you and your leadership. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Thank you, Darren, that was fabulous. So I'm, going to, I'm going to kick off with the first question, just picking off where you were there. So you, you gave our fellows here, in fact, everybody else who's here really, the challenge of, of leadership here, but what are the main qualities that, that are, are needed from those leaders? Well, thank you. I'm so honored to be here and uh, really excited about this opportunity. I think leadership today requires uh, EQ and IQ. And I think IQ is generally pretty easy to come by. There are a lot of smart people in the world. Uh, EQ, real authentic empathy, a willingness to Put yourself in the shoes of others, others who are different, others who may not agree with you, uh, and motivate, inspire, and mobilize people is what is needed in leadership today. But it's very hard because we live in a very diverse world, and leading today is much harder than it was 20 years ago. Uh, and so I think uh, when I think about my own leadership, I think it's important that we be authentic, that we be vulnerable, that we be comfortable with uh, our infallibility, um, and uh, we, we don't have the answers mm -hmm. to all uh, the questions. Um, and I think a curiosity about the world is a really important quality. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to throw it open. I've got lots of questions, actually, but I'm sure you've got lots of questions, too. So I'm going to throw it open now uh, to the audience. So we do have people who are walking around with roving mics. Could roving mic people make yourself present? Thank you, so people know where you are. If you do want to speak and ask if you just put up your hand, as gentlemen did, right at the middle at the back there. Perfect. Um, and then indicate. And then there's a person, uh, person down here with a black and white scarf and the person in the middle with a white jumper who had a hand up. Yeah, yeah, you, because you were really quick off the mark. Hello, my name's... Three first. Hello, my name's Chris Brooks. I actually work for an organisation called the UK Health Forum, and one of the things we look at is health inequalities. But I want to start with a, a question. You talked about persistent prejudice, which I obviously cannot uh, but agree with. But I'm in interested that you didn't talk about the persistent prejudice in a class way, you talked about race and 
ethnicity, sexuality, gender, but not class particularly. And I'm just intrigued, because obviously within the UK context, in terms of health, class would be the predominant feature, and then social exclusionary processes after that. So I, I, I pass the question to you now. How do you address that one? Thank you. That's a great question. And some of that reflects my own um, American uh, ignorance. And what I mean by that is we Americans think class matters less in our society. And that's something that you Brits and Europeans have in your cultures. Um, we have come to see that we are, in fact, according to the data, there is less social mobility today than there is in Europe. And, um, and so class is increasingly uh, relevant. So pardon me if I uh, did not emphasize that, but I, I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk about it uh, because I believe we talk about income, but uh, our own society in the United States as a result of, uh, as manifest uh, in a society where there is growing inequality, uh, social mobility is is more and more a function of your parents' income and the zip code in which you were born. And those factors uh, are basically the DNA that determines your future. And that is very, certainly in the American context where we have believed that social mobility is a right that no one cares who your father was or what your religion is or from what part of the country you hail. Um, we have seen uh, increasingly that those variables, in fact, seem to matter more than ever. And therefore, to be able to talk about class and as we have been doing recently in the US in our work, talking about working class white people. Because we have, for the first time in the US, something we have never experienced. And that is a substantial population of downwardly mobile white people. And in a, and in a context like the United States, um, that is very problematic. It's problematic that we have stagnant income for everyone. It's problematic that we have persistent poverty generation after generation of the descendants of slaves. But we have never experienced the newest phenomenon which has huge consequences for our politics. And that is uh, a substantial number of white Americans who feel increasingly hopeless, vulnerable, and anxious about their future. Yes, thank you. With white jumper, thank you. Hi, I'm Peggy Jean-Louis from LSE Advancement, the business partnership manager. I am very curious to know your thoughts or what you've ov been overhearing from corporates and businesses, their role in addressing inequalities, because it, all, it, d it affects everybody. So I'm curious to know, even if your board of directors, who you have some, um, some senior executives, what their, wh what their view is the role of business helping? Well, I think the forward-looking business leaders see that growing inequality is a problem for business. Uh, at the, at its most fundamental idea, I mean, if, if these trends play out over time, there will actually be fewer customers. Because customers in, a, in, a, in an economy where wages are not growing, but the basic necessities of life continue to grow, people will have less disposable income. And most industry provides uh, goods and services that, that come from the disposable income uh, of, of most uh, 
most consumers. And so when you have in the U.S., for example, the rating aging, agencies, Moody's and S&P, saying that the trends around inequality are alarming for business, are alarming for the ratings of companies because their future ability to pay back their debt will be imperiled by the trend of inequality, that says something. Now, I should also acknowledge the reality that the, when I talk about the systems of our economy that produce bad outcomes for far too many people, some of those systems are the systems that make business behave in short-term ways. An attention to quarterly earnings, um, uh, a, a slavish uh, uh, attention to the price of the stock, the, 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 the value of the share on any given day. Those businesses who think long-term understand that they have to have a long-term vision that isn't just about the price of the stock, but that is about engaging the stakeholders in the company, that is about sustainability and the environment, because ultimately climate change will have a material impact on the value of the enterprise. And therefore, I think those business leaders who have the courage, because I think it does take courage, to stand up and say, it's not just about the price of the stock, it's about our delivering for all of our stakeholders. Thank you. Hi, hi, Connie Jackson. I'm an LSE alum, and I have my own branding firm here. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank really you. excited. Um, uh, in listening to the talk about inequality, so much of it has risen out of the creation of global markets, which have th therefore created global fortunes, unlike the Ford foundations and many of those. Um, uh, fortunes that were built initially in local markets and took time to grow. It seems as if most of the, so much of the money that's been made in this last part of the 20th century, 21st century, was made quite quickly, quite easily, and so there wasn't sort of this long struggle and people are much younger. And we're now facing one of the largest wealth transfers that are expected over the next 10 to 15 years um, to the next generation, and there doesn't seem to be a philanthropic spirit, w just at a time when we have many, many more problems. Uh, how do you, how do you, how can a something, so, an, an entity like Ford, help bring along more philanthropists to deal with many more of these of these issues? Sure, that's a great question. Thank you. I actually am encouraged by the vitality of the new emerging philanthropists. Uh, whether we're talking about philanthropists in Silicon Valley or in other parts uh, of the Global South, um, in, in places like Nigeria or India, where you are seeing for the first time uh, people with tremendous wealth. Uh, now, what they do with that wealth and how it manifests through uh, philanthropy is the question. And I appreciate your asking, what does Ford do about that? How do you think about that? I, I do believe we have an obligation to engage with new philanthropy, to share the wisdom of, of many successes and many failures, and to hopefully allow uh, people like Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan and CZI, with whom we work at the foundation on a number of initiatives, to benefit from um, the uh, legacy of work that we have done, for example, we're working with CZI on, on a major housing initiative in the Bay Area. The Ford Foundation has been working on housing since the 1960s in the U.S. And so um, the folks at CZI reached out to us and said, what could we learn from you as we think about uh, initiating a housing program in the Bay Area? So I do see um, lots of reasons to be encouraged. I'm not Pollyannish. I do worry that in many places the kind of philanthropy that uh, we see is not, um, it is not what I think of as social justice philanthropy. 
What I mean by that is I, uh, I wrote an essay uh, entitled The New Gospel of Wealth a couple of years ago, and in it I articulated that the new gospel of wealth based on uh, Andrew Carnegie's 1889 essay called The Gospel of Wealth needed to move beyond the uh, principles articulated by Carnegie, because those are principles that were in some ways based on uh, our notions of generosity um, and charity um, and the impulse to help our fellow uh, men, men and women. I believe that we, uh, that today philanthropies uh, must, be, uh, must be motivated by justice. Um, generosity isn't enough. Um, generosity allows those of us who are privileged to be um, comfortable uh, in our giving. Uh, justice re requires this, that, that we get uncomfortable. And privileged people and privileged institutions really don't like being made uncomfortable because our privilege allows us, whether we are a wealthy uh, British business person or uh, a wealthy American foundation, our privilege allows us to insulate ourselves from some of the uncomfortable truths about our societies. And so I hope that as we think about justice, that we get a little uncomfortable, that we interrogate our own uh, behaviors, uh, the structures within our own institutions, whether it be LSE or the Ford Foundation, um, and, and take that on, because only then will we really be able to address inequality. That's an excellent question. Okay, flurry of hands. Um, person with the blue scarf, and then person just behind you, and person to the left there. So that's a little cluster there. So if we just take you in sequence, a little batch in the middle there. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Reem. I'm part of the Cities program here at LSE. Um, so I wanted, I, I would like you to, if you could, elaborate more on what you mentioned about the housing question that you're working on with the Bay Area. And because inequality, one of the biggest manifestations of inequality is within the housing market. And so I'm curious, how can investment play a role that can mitigate inequality in the housing market rather than exasperate it? Uh, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, Housing is at the core of living a life with dignity and the opportunity for uh, improvement. And uh, our housing policy reflects uh, a society's commitment to the ideals of opportunity and justice. And um, it's very, very challenging because housing is about getting to choose who you live with. And most of us want to live with people like us. And that is a truth that often flies in the face of our ideals and our aspirations for society. So at a macro level, we want diversity. We want uh, uh, mix, mixes of incomes. And we want to be um, in vibrant communities. At a micro level, most of us choose housing that is occupied by people who have incomes like us, who have uh, experiences, professional and otherwise, that are similar in some way. And so I think this is where um, the getting uncomfortable uh, gets really, really hard. And I'll use my own example because I live uh, in Manhattan on a park in, in, a, in, a, in a nice apartment. And <laughs> And uh, there are, we have a housing crisis in New York City. On every other block, 
in some parts of the city, you will see people homeless. And so the city of New York has gone about a program to house some homeless people in what were probably hostile-like uh, accommodations that, were, that are in our neighborhood. Now, I live in a, on, a, on a block with probably pretty progressive people. And yet, the announcement that the city was renting a couple of hostels in our neighborhood set off a wildfire of, of a response from these liberal, progressive, forward-thinking, diversity-seeking New Yorkers. <laughs> and I say that because, because all of the nimbyism, not in my backyard, my American, yes, we did, uh, yeah. all of the nimbyism that we see manifest e emerged. And it, it is, again, this difference between the macro, our aspirations, and, and the, the need for policy, because only with policy can you impact what is the impulse to exclude. I mean, it, it, is, it is, again, no one wakes up and says, I'm seeking to exclude someone today. <laughs> but the systems and structures that advance the privilege of privileged people like me and disadvantage those people who were simply seeking decent housing. The systems and structures, the tailwinds are, are behind me and the headwinds are facing them. And so unless there is intervention, policy, to address the housing challenge, we will not succeed in reducing inequality. Thank you. So, yeah, hi. Um, I'm Josh. I'm actually a 616 student at the City Academy Hackney. Um, I've got like two kind of two questions, but it leads to the, another question. So um, I was asked, because well, this is about inequality, um, I was wondering about your views on Barack Obama and um, his administration and um, how he actually um, dealt with equality, inequality, especially in the black community. And which is leading on to my second question. Um, you're from America, so you would agree with me that um, after his as, as administration, like the black communities like Chicago, Baltimore, they're more deprived um, now compared to before his administration. Um, but I think, um, don't you think um, that um, there could be an, um, an element of personal responsibility when um, you're tackling inequality. So like the black community, um, like there isn't really like a, a good atmosphere to like have economic prosperity. So like things such as the black homicide rate, which is incredibly high in these communities. Um, so in the 1960s, the single parenthood rate in the black community was 25%, now it is 75%. And um, unless you can say that racism has tripled during the civil rights movement, don't you feel as if like there should be a, as well as you know, um, government regulation and policies, don't you feel as if um, that um, the black community should actually look at themselves and you know say, like, like do you know where I'm coming from? Yeah. Yes, I do. Thank you, Josh. And I do. So let me first just. Uh, address your point about uh, uh, President Obama, who um, I was um, and remain a great admirer of President Obama's. Uh, I felt that he served um, the country with, um, with great uh, dignity and um, courage. Um, and as our first African American who was elected president, um, I felt that he uh, overcame uh, many of the barriers uh, and made all Americans and many people around the world very proud um, that the American people would elect him. Um, 
there are uh, policies that he advanced that I uh, supported, and there were some um, that I wasn't excited about. Um, but I do believe that um, he served uh, the country with distinction. Um, I do also believe that, as, uh, as has been written, um, he was in some ways uh, not fully uh, able or willing to address specific issues related to the African-American community. Uh, this has been documented in, in, the, in the media in America. Um, uh, I think he and we uh, <coughs> were surprised, uh, and in some ways we were naive in thinking that the election of a black president would serve to heal uh, America's racial divisions. I think we were surprised that in fact uh, the election of Barack Obama unleashed a level of, 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 of response from many Americans that was clearly racist um, and clearly a rejection of the idea that a descendant of slaves could govern the United States of America. And that um, someone who uh, is, is uh, black, and while he technically wasn't a descendant of slaves, he was a descendant of an African. And uh, that idea to many uh, people uh, was abhorrent. And I think the effort to delegitimize him, to say that he, he just wasn't legitimate, that he wasn't born in America, that uh, the entire movement to, um, to make him un-American, I think was in part a response to that. Now your question about personal responsibility is I think a very relevant one and one about which there is much debate in the US. Um, and it does, I think, uh, for social, I think for social scientists, it's a particularly interesting question uh, because it is a fact that uh, mobility and economic uh, advancement of black immigrants is higher than incumbent African Americans. The research has been pretty clear on that. And so to your point, how important is race in one's advancement? Is there something particular about a society who has a population of people who were descendants of an era when it was illegal to educate blacks. I mean, I think that's what people find shocking, is that for a significant part of America's history, and in much of America, it was legally, it was legally illegal. <laughs> you could be jailed for teaching a black person to read or write, or if you were a black person and you were caught self-educating, you were committing a crime. And so that is that legacy for that population of African Americans is a very different legacy than the legacy of a Nigerian immigrant who through self-selection and other means finds themselves in the United States and actually relative to African Americans has higher levels of achievement. I think it's a really interesting question of research for social science. Um, and it's something that we are certainly interested in at the foundation. Excellent. Uh, so I've got a flurry of hands, but I did have somebody waiting just there. Yes, you've got to use this part. Pass the microphone around. No, no, sorry, here. Sorry, just in front. If you could just wave your hand up and then the person knows you're coming. 
going to get it. And then I'll take the next batch of questions in a minute. Okay, so ready with your hands, okay? Just, just <laughs> get ready. This one. Thanks. I am Alberto. I just finished a master's degree in sociology here at the LSE. Um, you talked a little bit about the role of business in solving inequalities in particular, given that in a way it's in their interest for their long-term objectives and everything. Um, I was wondering your thoughts on impact investing as a field, mm -hmm. who which looks to be at sort of the intersection between business, philanthropy, and the public sector. So how hopeful are you in a general sense of impact investing achieving a real impact? And, um, and how do you think impact investing might change philanthropy five, ten years down the line? Thanks. Thank you. I am very hopeful about impact, for, uh, uh, impact investing and philanthropy. Um, we at the Ford Foundation have made a billion dollar commitment to impact investing. I chair the U.S. Alliance on Impact Investing. I believe that it is um, a critical uh, tool for philanthropy to leverage uh, our capital for social impact. Again, policy plays a critical role. It was really through the early work of Sir Ronald Cohen here in the UK who helped to build through um, the UK social finance program uh, a model that has now come to the US where more institutions are indeed committing themselves to impact investing. But it was only through the intervention of policy in the US from the United States Treasury and the Department of Labor, uh, Labor Department, which uh, ruled uh, that uh, ERISA, I don't want to get into long uh, 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 management issues uh, uh, and oversight issues of pension funds in the US, but ERISA is a big deal. And the Labor Department uh, basically uh, ruled that ERISA eligible, ERISA regulated uh, pension funds, which are most pension funds in the US, could when appropriate, use social objectives uh, to determine the, uh, the appropriateness of, of, of an investment. And so, and the Treasury Department ruled that, uh, gave guidelines, guidance as they say, that American private foundations could use our endowment capital for social impact. That we, and that uh, that was consistent with prudent oversight of endowments. So the bottom line is now we have policy that clears the way for us to accelerate our uh, investments in this area. But it's really hard to do that. This is an emerging field. Uh, the degree of evidence and research around these investments um, is somewhat limited. And the traditional investor investment uh, 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 community is, is somewhat wary because, again, this is change. And in an environment where if you are lucky, you're getting a 2 or 3% return, um, to uh, move into asset classes in which you feel mm -hmm. yield is even more at risk um, is asking a lot. I actually believe, as, as has been demonstrated, um, we can uh, generate an attractive financial return and uh, achieve social impact. So I'm very bullish. Excellent. Okay, so Florio fans are going to take my next back. A uh, person down here who's really quick off the mark, um, lady in the middle there, and then right at the top, um, waving hands. And then I know you're clustered around there, but I'm going to take you in the next batch, okay? Hi, I'm uh, Apu Suresh. I'm an Atlantic fellow. Uh, the role of capital in addressing inequality, there's a bit of a concern because it seems to be uh, used to only generate more inequality because it's stemming from the fact that it's affecting business. Okay, so there is a perpetrator-victim relationship here because it is affected not just in one form, but in multiple forms, democratic rights, societal, environment. So it, it leads us to a more fundamental question. Has capitalism failed? Mm -hmm. If yes, when do we hear from the corporate uh, leaders that uh, clear admission that it has failed? And what changes they want to bring to it? That's a great question. Has capitalism failed? Right, okay. <laughs> so we finish at eight, right? <laughs> I, think, 
I think capitalism has failed some. And capital, capitalism as we know it um, has served others. The issue is that we must have capitalism that works for more people. The notion that capitalism can only work if it generates the kinds of inequality that we see today and believe that that is sustainable must be rejected because capitalism has and can work for more people. And the, the, the way in which it will work for more people is a function of how we want to construct our economies. Inequality is a construction. I mean, we constructed it. We, it didn't emerge organically. We have policies, structures, institutions, practices, standards that all generate this inequality. We have systems of distribution that generate this. So why can't we have policies, systems, structures that promote more shared prosperity, that sh promote an idea of mobility? I do not believe that that is irreconcilable. Uh, I believe that if we have the right policies, if we have a tax system that is not regressive, um, if we have an economy that rewards hard work, if we have a government that is responsive to the needs of its citizenry, inequality can be attacked. Now, don't get me wrong. I do not believe that there should be no inequality. Of course, even the most liberal economists will say that some form of inequality in an economic system is, is all right. The question is, do we have a social protection system for those people who need it in an economy? Do we have a system of justice that is fair and that is not imbued with bias and prejudice against particular people in an economy? Um, I mean, those are the kinds of things that, that I believe we as a society, whether we're talking about the UK or Peru or the US, we have to address. Now, I probably sound naive because I know that I just talked about the drivers of inequality. And one of those drivers is that our governance systems, our political system, doesn't speak to the needs of the most vulnerable, the most disadvantaged in our society. And that's why it's so important that those of us who are privileged, that we speak about that, that we use our privilege to say, this isn't fair. A benefit that I'm receiving as a privileged person is not fair. And I think the more people who have power, influence, wealth, when Warren Buffett says there is something wrong with the American tax system because my, a sec my secretary pays a higher proportion of her income than I do, Warren Buffett has made this assertion. And it's a fact. So when people like him step forward and say, there is something wrong with our system. There is something unfair about our system. That gives me hope that there will be other people who will, like him, recognize that, sure, I may be wealthy today. I may have all the privilege in the world. But what's the world I'm leaving behind for my children and grandchildren? Yes, maybe. Yeah, um, good, uh, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Corinne Cater. I'm just a, a visitor. What do you think about the solution that some European countries are, you know, finding to deal with 
inequality and which is the universal wages. Because, I mean, is that a gimmick which is given by governments just to, you know, say that they have found a solution? So what do you think about it? Thank you for that question about the universal basic income, UBI as we call it in the U.S. And of course, uh, there is um, growing interest in UBI uh, from researchers, from policymakers, from people like Mark Zuckerberg, who talked about it in his commencement address at Harvard last year. I believe that uh, work matters in a society, and uh, the notion that uh, we should be planning for people to be without work is something that I find very disturbing. Um, again, I can speak with knowledge about my own country where work is at the center of, of an individual's dignity and their ability to navigate and negotiate uh, life. Um, and so, I believe that we need to understand what the future of work will be. It's one of the reasons we have a program called the Future of Work at the Ford Foundation because it is critical to understanding inequality. If, as some people say, we will be a world without work, um, I, I, I don't believe that is a world that is sustainable. Uh, and so, Many people worry that UBI uh, is problematic. In part, it's problematic because some of those who are propagating it as a solution are the winners in an economy that is rendering more people surplus. Um, and so I think that it, it, it has an important role to play as we think about social protection. It has uh, a lot of promise in some of the places where UBI has been piloted, in Africa, for example, um, and cash transfers have been um, successful uh, at a small scale, and so it would be interesting in those contexts to think about scaling them up. But I think in a context like the U.S., to say that in lieu of work, you will receive a check from the government um, and expect that to be sufficient, not only economically, but psychically, uh, is a real question. Okay. Um, so this is yeah, lady there, and then I'll take the next batch. First thing to do, Jennifer, yeah. Hi, my name is Julia Puebla Fortier, and I work on issues of health access for diverse communities. And I want to raise the issue of migrants. Um, migrants are substantial contributors to um, economies and um, diversity and cultural assets around the world, but they are substantially exploited and discriminated against and have a lot of difficulties accessing services and social protection. And so my question goes to the issue that you raised of narrative. Um, how do we change the narrative around migrants um, in our social discourse? Um, because that's such a significant barrier to being honest about what they contribute and the kinds of um, barriers to success that they often experience. I couldn't agree with you more, and I think the data support your statement. Uh, certainly uh, migrants, uh, immigrants who work, for example, in the United States, uh, pay taxes, pay into our social security system, um, and cannot benefit from that system, for example. Um, the backlash against immigration and migrants is in some ways a manifestation of inequality. 
people who are increasingly insecure, anxious, and vulnerable about their own economic well-being and their sense of cultural brotherhood and sisterhood, if you will, all of that anxiety manifests in an othering, an othering of people who do not look like me, and a need to rationalize what is happening in the world and what is happening specifically in my world. In my world, where I have played by the rules, worked hard, and yet I'm falling farther and farther behind. And I believe that my children will father, fall even farther behind. And so, as I was saying earlier about leadership and empathy, I think about what it must feel like to be vulnerable about work to not be certain that I have the financial wherewithal to support myself, my family, my children. I, I don't have those worries. I, I don't. I have a security that gives me the ability not to have to think about that. But I'm compelled to put myself in that person's shoes to understand how, how emotionally and psychically debilitating it must be to not know if you are going to have enough money to pay your rent or your mortgage. And if I'm confronted with that, if I have lost my job and I'm living in Youngstown, Ohio, and I am told that you lost your job to an immigrant, or you lost your job to some Chinese manufacturing plant, it is really easy to understand how I otherwise. Right? It is easy to understand, because I'm looking for an understanding of what is happening in the world. And so the narrative that you speak of becomes very compelling and very alluring because it allows me to understand what is happening to me. The people around me in my neighborhood where I grew up, which used to be all Irish, Italian immigrants, is now all people from Mexico and West Africa. What's happening to my world? I've lost my job. I went to college and it didn't cost anything. My children are going to college and they are going to have $50,000 a year debt just to pay for college. So I believe that until we start to understand how it feels and I'm discounting the people who are true racist, because there are people out there who, who are, are simply seeking supremacy. Those people are small in number, quite honestly. It's the people who, who are angry and whose anger is manifest in ways that speak out against uh, migrants uh, and asylum seekers. And so I, I think that until we start getting at that narrative and showing some empathy for that population of our fellow citizens, um, we're not going to make progress because they feel invisible. They f when we talk about, those of us at places like LSE and the Ford Foundation, and we talk about people who are marginalized, invisible, discriminated against. That's what they feel. That's what lower class white people in America feel, for example. And they have a reason in some ways to be angry 
because they've played by the rules. They've done what they were supposed to do, and they've ended up with the short end of the stick. Okay, so next match. So, uh, there's, yeah, there's gen I promised that one over there. Um, you've had your hand up right at the back there. You've been waving, and I need somebody from over here. So, if you person in blue shirt, just there. Where's my roving mic? Uh, so, yes, we yeah. can start there. My name is uh, Gianluca, and uh, I've been for a long time a kind of whistleblower. So basically, I've been uh, impressed about when, when you talk about people that they don't like to get out from their comfort zone, and they, they are in this privileged position, and so they are not keen to help the other people. But there is another thing, I think, that every time you try to address inequality, you expose yourself to some kind of retaliation, from, uh, especially from some industry or some other uh, kind of policy that basically they don't want to be affected by by you and the, because addressing inequality means b that I'm going to hit powerful people and uh, and that is going to be a problem because then you can be in dangerous position. I heard uh, recently about the story of a journalist in Malta that she has been murdered because she was investigating a kind of Panama Papers, so basically she related to tax evasion. So every time you try to address inequality because you said that uh, we should be as privileged a person to do that, you basically are in a situation where you don't have any kind of guarantee that justice is going to protect you. No, that, that you're absolutely right, and certainly um, the foundation has supported uh, the International Center, which um, did the investigative work on the Panama Papers, um, and in other places, journalists who uh, have been at risk. It's why journalism is so important in a democracy and why institutions that support journalism are important. It's why institutions, when we talk about the three eyes at the Ford Foundation, it's not some abstraction. Institutions matter. Institutions that work on behalf of the public interest, whether it is litigation uh, or, or the committee to protect journalists. I mean, these institutions exist to support people being courageous um, and to know that, that when you are courageous, you aren't alone. Because it is very true that the uh, embedded, entrenched uh, power structures that protect uh, those of us who are already privileged absolutely resist change. And, and that is why uh, journalism, why lawyers, uh, why research, why all of these things in a democracy matter because, because democracy making is really messy and it's not pretty. Um, but ultimately, as a society, it is satisfying if you can have a society that is more just and more fair and that's why we need institutions whose missions are to do that. Excellent, thank you. Um, hi, um, my name is Cheng and I'm doing public policy at UCL. Um, so I have a question about like, what do you think about the role of affirmative action in alleviating income uh, inequality? Because uh, when I have discussions with my friends and they feel like it's kind of like an action that depriving their rights, like with like, people having the same like performance. So I would like to know like how do you think about affirmative action? And the second question is about, um, because um, I would like to start an NGO in um, improving our uh, social mobility in back in Hong Kong. So I'm interested in learning, what do you think about the elements that help you to break through the glass ceiling comprised by like race, class, or like gender? So what are the elements that help you what to What are those elements? Improve, like, wow. <laughs> To like to to improve yeah. <laughs> like some key elements that help you to improve the social upward mobility. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so first, affirmative action. Um, the Ford Foundation, um, in many parts of the world where we work, have supported policies uh, of affirmative action, and we have supported those policies because whether it be in the United States with 
uh, underrepresented minorities, in Brazil with Afro-Brazilians, in India with uh, Dalits, there are historical reasons why people are marginalized today. And we, we believe that uh, those reasons uh, remain with us and that unless we are willing to address them frontally, uh, we will not see real progress. Because history, as James Baldwin said, is with us every day, our history. And the real challenge for affirmative action certainly in the U.S. context, is that it, it is not reconcilable for some who talk about uh, a society where race is not important, where class is not supported, or where, um, where uh, yes, we have that problem of racial discrimination, but it's not a problem anymore. Um, or a society that says, but we're a meritocracy. We've always been a meritocracy, and if we just allow ourselves to be a meritocracy, we won't need affirmative action. And I, I think that history and the reality uh, just fly in the face of that kind of rhetoric. Um, and so I believe that affirmative action remains uh, an important tool and I think if you look in a place like Brazil uh, or you look in India uh, at some of the advances that have occurred uh, as a result of affirmative action, while there are maybe some aspects of it or all of it that you disagree with, one thing is clear that more people who have been historically discriminated against are now being given opportunity. And so I um, while I believe that uh, personal responsibility and recognizing that the individual matters, um, the evidence of how advancement works in society um, would lead me to believe that we do need those interventions that help to ensure that we have more justice and more fairness. Could you just Well, well, I think I think what happens is is that um, affirmative action and uh, racism, discrimination, that a rhetoric has emerged in response to affirmative action. Um, so people say things like, "Well, didn't you?" read what Martin Luther King said. He said he just wanted to live in a society where people were judged by the character, their, the content of their character. That's what matters. Nothing else matters. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Now, there are specific ways in which we can look at our society and see that decisions are made that take into context, things that go well beyond the content of one's character. Things like your race, things like your gender, and that those biases are still reflected. When we have a major figure in science say, women just aren't meant to be scientists. I mean, they're just not. They're just, women aren't meant to be, well, that bias in some ways is still reflected in the sciences. So I actually believe that in the sciences, we should have a policy that says we need to affirmatively encourage the participation of women in the sciences. And so it is uh, not without controversy, but I believe it very, very uh, much. And so when you talk about, when you say what was uh, for me personally, um, affirmative action absolutely had something to do with my success. I was in the first class of Head Start, a program in the U.S. that was uh, designed 
for poor kids like me because I grew up and as a small boy was in a very uh, small town in Texas uh, where it still was uh, the black community next to the white community and the schools in my community were absolutely substandard. And so when the government created the policy of Head Start, that was in part to give people like me an opportunity. When the government created the Pell Grant program that made it possible for low-income college applicants to receive a tuition assistance uh, grant, it was because the government recognized that no one in my family had ever gone to college and that there was a role for policy to ensure that people like me were given an opportunity and that the fact that I came from a poor background should have no relevance on where I went to college. And so along the way, I have benefited from affirmative action, from private philanthropists. There was a wonderful Texas oil man who endowed a scholarship that I was the recipient of. Um, and so that made it possible for me to go to college and law school. Um, and and it, it was a combination of things, of public policy, of private philanthropy. Um, I would like to think of hard work, um, but, but all of it and a lot of luck made it possible for me to be here today. That's wonderful, thank you. Yeah. I'm Charles Sherwood. I'm a, a philosophy MSc student here at the LSE. Um, I wanted to return to a, a comment you made earlier um, that some elements of inequality are acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to me absolutely clearly right. Mm -hmm. I, I think everybody, well I imagine almost everybody in this room would agree that we should reduce absolutely. inequality. I, I believe that those who think carefully about it would not want to eradicate inequality. Mm -hmm. So how do we think about the distinction between acceptable inequality and unacceptable inequality? So that's a really uh, great question. And um, I think that uh, in, a, in a system where ideally you want people to be mobile, where you want people to aspire, you have to have incentives. And that makes a lot of sense to me. What doesn't make sense to me are the disincentives to mobility. Uh, the ways in which barriers are constructed that make opportunity um, hard to come by. And so I, what, is, what is not acceptable are those barriers. And so we should be looking at those barriers in a society and saying, how do we deconstruct those barriers? And how do we lift the playing field so that those people who historically have faced barriers can have a level playing field. T to my mind, that's, that's the way on a, at, a, at an abstract level. Uh, at a, a, it won't happen without policy. It won't happen. I mean, I was at a really interesting conversation panel or something with a, and there was an economist who was saying that what we, and this was an American economist talking about our American economy, and what he was saying was that we need, if we have less regulation and we implement policies that give business and others more flexibility, uh, that we'll get more of what we're getting now, that we'll get more, and we'll actually be able to have more growth more, and he, did, he was very emphatic about getting more. And I said, you know, I actually don't want more of what we're getting now from the economy. I, I don't want more inequality. I don't want more wet wage stagnation. I don't want more sectors of society feeling completely shut out of economic opportunity and mobility, because that's what our economy has been delivering. So please tell me how we can deliver a really great, vibrant economy 
where wealth is being created, in the, but that isn't delivering more of that. I want to know how we get to that, because I, it is not acceptable that what we want is more of what we're getting now. Excellent. Okay, we have round for one last round of questions. Uh, so, um, person just behind there. Oh, the lady in the middle. Uh, yes, lady in the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's a bit of a house question. Um, and then, just gentlemen at the end, they're waving a pencil. The, the pencil waver. Wave your pencil. So, exactly, there you are, pencil <laughs> waver. Thank you. Thanks. It's good to wear something bright and wave things <laughs> at these things. Yeah. Hello, I'm Callum Miller from the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford oh. University. Um, Darren, I'm really interested in the impact investing answer that you gave. Um, Ford Foundation's put, I think, one billion of its 12 billion endowment into impact investing. And I really want to ask, in your tenure as president, whether you want to see that number rise, and if so, what you see as the barriers to being able to increase that proportion of your endowment committed to impactful investment? Well, you all at Blavatnik are doing great work um, in this area, as you know. So um, I would only say that, in all candor, the barriers are, uh, to growing that number are completely uh, constructed internally. Uh, our, our trustees, uh, I am very lucky because at the foundation, uh, the four trustees and our CIO have really gotten behind this idea and understand that we are experimenting and that we're in this moment of innovation and that the foundation should, just as we did 50 years ago with the program related investment, that we should be a leader in innovating in this space. But philanthropy, organized philanthropy, is not a sector, in spite of what we say, that really likes to change. And, um, and we're really good at the rhetoric of changing. Uh, but when we interrogate our own practices, it's, uh, it's really interesting. And I say that uh, because I just think about my own institution and, and where we fall short, where we fall short in this area, and we do. Uh, I'm reminded of a, of a recent <coughs> example of, of um, talking about knowledge and how we think about knowledge creation and funding research. And there is this sense of how we privilege credentialed knowledge over authentic lived experience of people in communities and how we will pay millions of dollars for research products that reflects the thinking of a group of brilliant PhD. So with all due respect, <laughs> at the same time, we don't always listen to the voices and the perspectives and bring in the authentic knowledge of people who are living every day with the problem we're trying to solve. And so we, foundations, changing our own practice. We like the way our endowments are run and are managed. Uh, of course, there is a contradiction. I mean, one of the reasons the four trustees got behind this idea was because I said to them that it was hard for me to rationalize our social justice imperative with an investment policy that says, we seek to simply maximize returns. That, that, that's not reconcilable. And that, if, and that again, we can have the rhetoric that we want to have, but if we actually want to interrogate our own practices, then we really do have to change. And that's really uncomfortable because we sort of like it the way it is. You know, and, and so, you know, in everything that we do, 
we had a recent situation. Now, this is, again, I'm sorry to be projecting on about all my internal problems, but, <laughs> but you know, we'll I mean, but you know, what do you do when you, yeah. you know, you, it's, it's what, what do you do at an institution that has an elite way of recruiting? Mm -hmm. What happens when a great candidate who doesn't have a college degree appears? You say, oh, but we've never not hired anyone who doesn't at least have a bachelor's degree. I mean, you really can't expect someone to be in a professional position at a major important foundation. Being the representative of the foundation, people usually have master's degrees or PhDs. Well, but what if this person's knowledge, their leadership, their management, their understanding of the problem is truly from from a lived experience and an authentic engagement with the communities that we are seeking to help. What does an institution do that is used to doing things in its own privileged elite kind of way when presented with that? What does an institution do when it's presented with evidence that in spite of its wonderful progressive rhetoric, it has no accommodations for people with disabilities. Its website, I mean, just go down everything. Its employment practices, everything. None of us do. None of us do. And, and yet, we call ourselves these great institutions that are looking to the future and seeking more justice and fairness in the world. Um, and so what I have to do is interrogate my own behavior, uh, my institution's behaviors, which, which contribute to the very systems and structures that we need to be deconstructed. Right, any other? Hi, I'm Sarah. I work at LSE, and I work with Atlantic Philanthropies to design the program, and I was so delighted to be able to hand that responsibility over to Rana. <laughs> <laughs> um, ha giving money away in big amounts is such a responsibility. So I wondered what other foundations you look to as being exemplars in the field. Well, thank you for that question, and I concur. I'm happy you passed it on to Rana, oh, yeah. who is, by the way, a Ford Foundation alum, <laughs> I am very proud to say. So I think there are many foundations that we look to at the Ford Foundation for wisdom, for guidance, for inspiration in different ways. And um, I, I particularly work uh, very closely with foundations like the Open Society Foundation, which, uh, Julie, you said that the Ford Foundation was the second largest as of last week. We no longer are. Yeah. I am proud to say, actually, that the Atlantic Philanthropies, with their um, $18 billion, is now the second largest, and I'm proud to say that because um, uh, Open Society uh, uh, Foundations have been our partners. Uh, everywhere in the world we work, OSF is a key partner uh, because they are very focused on issues of human rights, uh, racial justice, uh, class, I mean, uh, asylum, I mean, all of the major issues facing the world, OSF has been on the front lines. And I uh, admire that uh, institution. Uh, George Soros, its founder, um, has been remarkable. Um, Atlantic, of course, and Chuck Feeney, a model of a spin down foundation. Um, if you're going to spin it down, give 60 million pounds to LSE for a new initiative on inequality. Um, the, what Atlantic did um, and Chuck Feeney's legacy is immeasurable in the world. And this is but one of his legacies. It is really astounding on every continent to see the impact of Atlantic. Phenomenal. And we're incredibly grateful for them. And if anybody is here thinking of winding down a foundation, okay, you heard it right here. Okay. <laughs> Last um, thank you. Uh, I'm Sean Bain. I'm the chair of the Equality Trust. Uh, and we came out of the spirit level in 2009 and the uh, demonstration of the consequences of inequality. 
And I think my final, I think this is the final question, just sort of summing up question, which is, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the next 20, 25 years? If we look at the last 25 years since the Thatcher-Reagan era, the neoliberalism agenda, which we would argue very strongly has led to increased inequality, are there signs now, do you think, that we are actually at a tipping point, uh, at a cusp, if you like, where things are going to change? Uh, we could quote a whole number of intellectual arguments that have taken place, books that have been produced, and so on. Uh, we could argue in terms of the international institutions, the IMF, the OECD, uh, the Pope, the Governor of the Bank of England, they all come out now against inequality. The, in a sense, those arguments have been won. And being parochial here in the UK, we can look at the last election. Uh, which wasn't just, uh, in a sense, about the Labour Party, it was also about the Conservative Party, whose manifesto went to the left. Uh, Theresa May talks about industrial democracy, about pay discrepancies, and so on. Um, and then we had the actual result of the election. Do you, and I'm not quite sure if you would feel any of that is reflected in Trump's America, which might be a, a, an interesting point. Do you think, if we looked back in 20, 25 years' time, we will be able to say to that generation, that's when things changed. Things started to change 2017, 2018, 19, 20. We can look back at that 25 years' time. We can see those little indicators at that time, and things really changed. And the world in 20 to 25 years will be a more equal place. I couldn't agree with you more that uh, the the leading institutions in the world have all come to realize how pernicious inequality is. And so, um, as I said, when you have uh, major uh, corporations, uh, when you have just about every uh, important uh, institution in, in society um, speaking of this as an imperative to address, uh, we've made progress. I think. I am radically optimistic about the future. Um, and I'm optimistic in part because we all are a product of our own lived experience. And my own lived experience is one where um, my, I mean, it is, it is uh, hard to imagine uh, for many how someone from my background and my narrative would occupy the position I occupy today, but I actually don't think it's that remarkable. And it, in some ways, has imbued me with the sense of hope and the sense of, uh, of a belief in the future. Having said that, I believe that people understand the implications for inequality now. And and the call to action to mobilize citizens to take it on is growing in every society. And while it, it is uh, visible, those who would seek to divide us and seek to otherize some of our fellow citizens, uh, the vast majority of people are people who are good-hearted and generous and are not mean and mean-spirited uh, or greedy. I mean, all of these things uh, manifest in our society, but I think that, that there always has to be darkness before there is light. And I truly believe, and I think about this every day, that we can get out of this bad place that we are in. And we have to acknowledge that we are in a bad place. And I don't, uh, and again, even if you might disagree with someone politically uh, on, on various issues, um, there is a growing sense, just about every survey of public opinion, that we are on the wrong track. And therefore, the consensus, that is a consensus. I mean, there is something to mobilize around. Doesn't mean that everyone agrees on what the solution ought to be. But it does mean that, that for leaders, 
to say, we have to change. We have to do things differently. And particularly for those leaders of privilege to say that gives me hope. And I'm seeing that more and more. Okay, I know there are many, many more questions in the room, and but we do have to call a halt there. I think we should just thank Darren for what has been the most fascinating evening. <laughs>